Aloha. Welcome to Politics in Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii with Dennis Isaki. Today we'll be speaking with Mufi Hanneman, former athlete, teacher, coach, city council chair, and mayor of Honolulu. Among his accomplishments, he was a White House fellow and a Fulbright scholar. He also worked for four U.S. presidents. Now the CEO of the Hawaii Hotel and Lodging Association he has his work cut out for him. Oh yeah, in Hawaii, who asked what school you went? And we mean high and we mean high school. I think he went to Punahou Lower Campus called Iolani. <laughs> <laughs> then on to Harvard University. Mufi, welcome. We have so much ground to cover, so please start by telling us about your time in Washington, D.C. with all the president. Well, you know, it was a wonderful opportunity. Obviously, uh, I've always been interested in government. That's what I majored in at Harvard. Uh, U.S. history was always my favorite subject, along with English at Iolani. And I was raised at a very early age uh, to look to give back to the community, uh, to whom much is given, uh, much is expected. Uh, so my parents uh, raised us in Kalihi, or raised me in Kalihi, and I went to three public elementary schools there, Fern, Kalihi, Kaipuahale, went to Iolani, matriculated at Harvard, and I did a Fulbright uh, in University of Wellington, uh, in New Victoria University in Wellington, New Zealand. So uh, it was the uh, fact that I started in public service with Governor George Ariyoshi uh, led to my first opportunity to serve a presidential administration, and that was President Jimmy Carter. Uh, who I worked in the Office of Territory and International Affairs. Uh, later, I was able to serve uh, President Ronald Reagan during his administration uh, by being appointed uh, to the Office of the Vice President of the United States, and that was George uh, Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, very, very fortunate to have received uh, that appointment. It was a very coveted post, because in the White House Fellows Program, everybody wants to work for the President of the United States. Uh, and. Um, uh, you don't get that opportunity on a one-on-one, -on -one, if you will, but the vice president's office affords you that. And so uh, I was able to be selected uh, by uh, Vice President Bush, uh, traveled around the world, because that's what vice presidents do, uh, and made lots of friends and relationships and networking contacts and the like. Uh, then I also served his son, uh, George Herbert, George uh, Walker Bush, uh, in uh, his administration by being on the uh, U.S. Secretary of uh, Labor's uh, Apprenticeship Committee. Uh, so that was a, a very a wonderful opportunity to do that uh, there. And then during President Clinton's time, uh, I was the U.S. Representative to the South Pacific Commission uh, in the Department of State. Uh, so I represented our country amongst uh, the nations that make up uh, Oceania. And then during President Obama's time, obviously it was a very close working relationship with him. Uh, I actually met him when he was at Punahou, and uh, he was playing for the Punahou basketball team. I was the coach at Iolani, uh, so we forged a relationship then. It continued where uh, uh, when I became mayor, uh, there was only two mayors that he always used to do a shout out to. One was Mayor Richard Daly of Chicago, uh, and the other one was yours truly because of our personal relationship and uh, did many things with them uh, to further the interests of the mayors because I was the chair of the tourism committee of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. So all of those relationships obviously gave me an opportunity to lobby uh, the U.S. Senate, advocate in the U.S. House of Representatives, met lots of wonderful uh, senators uh, and representatives through the year, had a very close relationship with Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, a good friend of uh, Senator Akaka in particular and Senator Inouye, uh, and of course, senators like uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, and the like were uh, always very cordial, receptive uh, to anything that I would bring before them that would benefit uh, the state of Hawaii. And when I was mayor, in particular, the city and county of Honolulu. Oh, that's uh, a lot of things you did. Uh, what exactly is a White House Fellow and the Fulbright Scholar? Yeah, White House Fellow is, uh, was a program that was started by President Lyndon Johnson uh, back in 1964 to encourage young Americans to come to Washington, D.C. Uh, after you are selected uh, and you get to uh, then serve uh, in one of the departments, or in my case, the White House. Uh, wonderful opportunity to uh, work in Washington, D.C. 
but they have this thing called the education program, which allows you uh, to meet uh, as a group uh, with movers and shakers throughout the country, throughout the world. And then every White House Fellows class gets to take a uh, uh, has an opportunity to visit a foreign country. And in our case, we wanted to go to the Middle East. So we went to Israel, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Jordan uh, during my time. Uh, so that's what the White House Fellows Program is, is all about. Uh, and so uh, that led to uh, me creating a home here called the Pacific Century Fellows Program, uh, made up of outstanding young leaders uh, in the state of Hawaii. Uh, then uh, the Fulbright Fellowship is something that you receive after you graduate uh, from college. So I applied for a Fulbright Fellowship, became a Fulbright Scholar, and I selected uh, New Zealand, uh, where uh, uh, to me, it made a lot of sense because uh, I am of Polynesian descent. Uh, Auckland is the largest Polynesian city in the world in terms of different Polynesian ethnic groups uh, throughout the city of Auckland and in New Zealand. Uh, and so uh, I use that to study more about the uh, Pacific Island nations and territories. Uh, wonderful opportunity too to play basketball uh, throughout uh, New Zealand. You know, rugby is is king there. Uh, but uh, when I was there, they uh, uh, said that you know they wanted to develop the game of basketball, and so uh, I was in early on uh, in the country's uh, growing interest in basketball. So their rugby team, Dennis, is known as the All Blacks. They're the number one rugby team in the world, and then what they call the basketball team, the Tall Blacks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So why why move back to Hawaii when you're rubbing shoulders with everybody in the in D.C., especially the four presidents? Well, I, you know, I've always wanted to be here and, um, you know, I knew that this was home and you, you asked a really good question because when I was finished with my, my White House fellowship, um, there was an opportunity for me to stay there uh, or to move uh, to another state uh, and basically uh, stay involved uh, with uh, things that are happening at the national level. Uh, but I met a wonderful uh, man, uh, uh, JWA Doc Byers, who used to head up C Brewing Company, uh, and he made me a wonderful offer, and I wanted to come home. Uh, so I came back home. But before I worked for C Brewing Company, uh, I went back uh, to work for Governor George Ariyoshi, who I'm really indebted to because he gave me my start in public service. Uh, so uh, I worked in his office. I was one of several young special assistants, uh, and the responsibility he gave me was for Pacific Island areas. Uh, and then from there, uh, I also worked in the Waihei administration. Governor John Waihei made me uh, his director of the Office of International Relations, as well as the state director of the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Uh, so those two gentlemen uh, really um, provided me that opportunity here at home uh, to be in public service. And I'm very indebted to them. I learned a lot from them. Uh, Governor Ariyoshi was a fiscal conservative. Uh, he didn't like to waste taxpayers' dollars. He was always very frugal uh, with uh, the public uh, dollars. And with Governor John Waihei, uh, it was all about being very creative, all about, you know, thinking beyond the box and, you know, going beyond just being a place of sun, sand, sea, and surf, uh, and, you know, seeing how we can compete with the rest of the world. So I had a lot of latitude uh, to travel, promote Hawaii nationally, internationally, uh, and, you know, he kind of called me his secretary of state uh, when I was working for him, but first as a director of international relations and as the DBED director is when I really got involved uh, with our industries here, military, agriculture, uh, the other diversified activities that we tried to do during that time. And of course, our number one industry to today, tourism. So in that job, uh, I got to travel around. I went back to my roots. Uh, you know, uh, my parents are originally from uh, Samoa. Uh, and so uh, with the uh, relationships that I had been developing at the Office of International Relations and the like, uh, it gave me an opportunity to meet the leaders through my involvement with the East-West Center, uh, through Governor Ariyoshi and Governor Waihe, uh, and also uh, with respect to meeting with island nations and leaders. You know, the governor of the state of Hawaii is in a very unique position. Not only does he represent the state, uh, here and also in Washington, D.C., but many times he's at the forefront of American relationships throughout the Pacific region. Uh, so in that case, uh, I, I was really given lots of opportunities uh, 
in uh, my younger days in government uh, to meet a lot of these foreign leaders. Uh, I should say our brothers and sisters because they really are, especially our Pacific Island leaders, forges relationships that remain very strong to today. So uh, whether it's Guam, uh, CNMI, Palau, uh, the Marshall Islands, Federated States, uh, certainly throughout the Polynesia with Fiji, uh, Tahiti, Tonga, uh, Samoa, American Samoa, uh, and then of course uh, over in Melanesia with uh, the Solomon Islands uh, and all those other entities that make up uh, Melanesia. It really was a wonderful opportunity and I very feel, feel very strongly to today about the importance of Hawaii maintaining those relationships because we are part of the Pacific family. And when uh, you read the story of Hokulea uh, and what has happened, as you say, you witness what Nainoa Thompson is doing, it's kind of reawakening uh, the feeling that we should continue to have. Uh, and that is we are one family. We were navigated throughout the Pacific that way. Uh, and certainly as we fast forward to today, it behooves us to maintain that close family relationship with our Ohana in Polynesia, Melanesia, and Micronesia. Yeah, terrific. Um, you mentioned uh, Governor Ariyoshi. I think he ended up his, his term with like $300 million surplus or something. And, uh, and our friend John Waii came in. He, he did a lot of things, like you mentioned. The, uh, I know one was, I worked with him on the housing projects. Uh, he did a lot. Thousands of homes came up, um, beginning Kapolei, hundreds of millions of dollars. So they both did great things. You mentioned the uh, Hawaii Office of International Relations and the South Pacific Commission. Uh, I worked down in the Pacific Islands, uh, Palau, and uh, Marshall Islands. That's, that's where I learned about uh, the atomic bomb and all that with the Compact of Free Association. So we get a lot of these Pacific Islanders coming to Hawaii now. A yeah. lot of them, it's a large percentage of COVID cases. Uh, are you involved with those kind of things too? With the, well, your absolutely. Position? Let me spend a minute on the COFA, which you mentioned, the Compact yeah, yeah. of uh, uh, Free Association. Uh, that is very, very important. And I really am proud of our delegation. Senator Schatz, Senator Hirono, uh, Congressman Case, Congressman Kaheli, they feel very strongly that America uh, should honor its commitment uh, to those islands in the FSM, uh, in Palau, uh, and the Marshall Islands, who, as you know, during World War II, uh, were used as a test site, a bombing uh, area. Uh, and therefore, uh, the citizens that are there and remain today have you know, had to endure, or their, and their families had to endure, uh, the fallout from having these kind of tests through the years. So um, there's a situation now in Congress where those agreements have to be extended. Uh, and our delegation is right up front there, uh, urging the rest of the United States Congress and the Biden administration to move post haste uh, so that we can uh, honor these agreements. Now, it's true that a lot of them have left and they've migrated to places like Hawaii, California, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, and like with every immigrant group that comes uh, to a new homeland, they are going to encounter uh, problems of adjusting, be it language, be it culture, um, be it just employment skill, skills, education and training. So um, they uh, also, uh, along with many of the other Pacific Island entities here, uh, who have folks that have moved here and our native Hawaiian community uh, have not really uh, done as much well in the area of uh, getting the vaccination. Uh, and also we have to keep uh, on top of them to make sure, because a lot of times it's accessibility. It's them feeling that, you know, how can they afford uh, to go and see a doctor to, to get that, or don't realize that you don't have to see a doctor uh, to be able to do a, a COVID test. Uh, and, um, and certainly now as we try to emphasize more and more vaccination. So I am doing my part along with other folks of uh, Polynesian, Micronesian ancestry, or just people in Hawaii that call Hawaii home uh, to ensure that we bring everyone along uh, as we preach the importance uh, of being vaccinated, but making sure that we can cope successfully uh, with this COVID-19 because uh, the variant that is raging around us now uh, is something like, uh, like no other that we have seen. 
nothing that we have seen uh, of late in terms of how um, it can cause serious harm uh, and hospitalize you and sometimes uh, cause even a death in the family of a death of a loved one uh, if you don't take the necessary precautions to try to head it off. And that's why this whole thing that we talk about, especially in my present job today, uh, for everyone uh, to observe uh, and social distancing, wear your mask, uh, do all the things that uh, that's important uh, to make sure that uh, we are a healthy and safe community uh, and that we don't let our guard down uh, so that um, we get a situation where you know, we may lose a loved one uh, or we ourselves might be uh, endangered because we're not doing the necessary things we need to do to keep ourselves healthy and free uh, and safe uh, from this COVID. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, regarding COFA, do you know if Hawaii got uh, federal funds to accommodate these uh, Pacific Islanders? Well, that's the argument that's being made right now. And I know uh, both uh, uh, members of our delegation have introduced legislation to ensure that there will be federal funds set aside uh, in addition to what the Biden administration would want to do. So um, as I said, I'm very, very proud of the efforts that they're putting forward there because through the years prior to their service, uh, it was always Senator Inouye, uh, you know, Senator Akaka, you know, they did the same thing. And of course, Senator Matsunaga, Congresswoman Patsy Mink, um, you know, Congressman Eftel. I mean, you can just go down the line of all those that have served uh, in the nation's capital uh, that have always felt this special kinship and they look up to us. And Dennis, you experienced that. I'm sure many of the friends that you made when you traveled throughout Micronesia, uh, they're still very close to you to today. Uh, and it's, it's our obligation and responsibility to help them uh, come into the mainstream here uh, and be uh, very productive citizens. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, moving on to DBDT, uh, Business and Economic Development and Tourism. When you were there, I guess we we're pushing for tourism. Didn't we even have a race car with the uh, Hawaiian vacations on the side or something? <laughs> oh, you remember that? Huh? Yeah, <laughs> that was uh, that was a project that uh, we uh, and HVCB, well, we they call it Hawaii Visitors Bureau at that time. Um, you know, novel idea came before us and uh, governor liked it and uh, some others in the community liked it. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a tough sell uh, because many of our folks in the industry couldn't see how you could promote Hawaii uh, through a dragster car uh, that was being uh, traveling throughout the country at, at these various uh, racing competitions and the like. So uh, I did not have a long uh, history with it because I think I gave it like six months uh, to prove uh, that it could be uh, productive and meaningful and then all the um, metrics that we put out then or certainly uh, wanted the measurements uh, for success so you want to make sure that it could meet certain criteria so uh, it was having a difficult time doing that because it was such a novel concept uh, but you know when you are in tourism to separate yourself or differentiate yourself from other destinations you know, you have sometimes these out of the box ideas that people throw before you. And if the money is there, you kind of take a look at it. And if it's not working, you shift gears and you move to something else. So the biggest thing we did while I was there in terms of tourism, I believe, was saving the Pro Bowl. I remember getting a call uh, from Roger Goodell, who at that time uh, was uh, a vice president to Commissioner uh, Paul Tagliabue. And he called the governor's office. Governor Wahe said if I could call him back and I remember talking to Commissioner, uh, well, now he's Commissioner Goodell. At that time, it was sort of the conversation went something like this. I got good news and bad news. The good news is we love the Pro Bowl in Hawaii. In fact, Maki Yanagisawa uh, deserves high praise for keeping the Pro Bowl here or bringing the Pro Bowl here at a time it was playing before no one throughout the United States. I remember one time the Pro Bowl was played in Buffalo, New York in the dead of winter or in the Coliseum. No one would go and when it came to Hawaii, we made it a sellout game besides the thousands of tourists that came here. But Goodell's message was this. I have good news and bad news. The good news is we want to keep the Pro Bowl in Hawaii. The bad news is that there are other places that want the Pro Bowl. So you folks have to pay something uh, for it because basically we would provide the Aloha Stadium and the expenses associated with that, and we didn't have to pay a fee. So in talking with Governor Waihe at that time, I said, you know, 
I checked on who our competition was. In those days, you didn't have the internet kind of go and get information fast. You had to, you had to either coconut wireless the bugger, or you had to get on that phone and you had to fax people and so forth. And uh, I, I remember uh, uh, telling him, I said, hey, I understand our competition is Orlando, Florida. Uh, and Orlando has Disney World. It has uh, the city of, uh, city, of, city of Orlando, which has a major sports authority. They're just not overseeing a swap meet because they don't have a swap meet at their stadium. You're talking about major sporting events that come to Orlando. And then the third thing is they have uh, ESPN and ABC. Uh, so they have all the elements to make it very successful. And we don't have that. So governor said, what do you suggest? I said, I think we need to promote this as a sports tourism opportunity. And that is with the monies that DBED uh, gets from the legislature for tourism, we transfer that over to Hawaii Visitors Bureau and then they do marketing. So let's call that sports marketing because uh, the Pro Bowl is played here. It's not just the 25,000 people that come to watch the Pro Bowl, assuming that half are tourists, half are local residents. But it's a fact that in the dead of winter, it's being shown uh, throughout the mainland and people watching it in, in their freeze and uh, freezing weathers uh, will see, wow, got to get out and see that sunshine. Look how sunny that beach is and so forth. So it would spawn other types of business opportunities for us. And then let's talk to the National Football League to expand uh, the benefits that we get from it. So they never used to give charitable grants, for example. Prior to that, I said, in return, we'll ask that they donate to the various, you know, Boys and Girls Club or the YMCA or whoever groups that we would suggest uh, to get help and then do football clinics throughout the state of Hawaii. Uh, and so um, that's how it went. And fortunately, uh, like people like Senator Milton Hope uh, in the legislature at that time was sports minded, both Milton and I uh, went to Harvard together. He played uh, football, I played basketball. And uh, he understood the importance of sports. And so we were able to save the Pro Bowl then. And then from then on out, it became a sports marketing uh, event uh, with funding from tourism uh, through uh, the Hawaii Visitors Bureau, later on with the Hawaii Tourism Authority. Hey, yeah, I recall all that. However, uh, when they came with that <laughs> request, uh, Bill Abercrombie had a different answer to them, though. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go into it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he'd be happy we talked about what he said. But the other thing I remember too, Dennis, your, your home island was involved in one of my experiences at DBED, uh, and I believe it was Hurricane Iniki uh, occurred uh, when it was either Iniki or Eva, maybe Iniki. But I remember um, Governor Wahe dispatching me uh, to Kauai to oversee the evacuation of tourists. Uh, from Kauai, because I was the director of DBED, uh, and then also at that time uh, working uh, with the county of Kauai uh, to try to uh, identify other industries to help uh, because tourism was going to be in a slump for a while. In fact, that philosophy uh, was throughout uh, the, the state of Hawaii uh, in that regard. But uh, yeah, and it brought me to Kauai many, many, many times, and Senator Kochi and I talk about that a lot because, wow. I remember coming to Kauai in the aftermath of that hurricane. Holy smokes. It was really devastated big time. Yeah, okay. As a president, CEO of the Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association, how do we balance tourism? Some people say parent over tourism and the pandemic. You know, uh, Dennis, uh, you know, I've, I've been involved with uh, heavily with uh, two of Hawaii's governors certainly have a working relationship with Governor Ige. Uh, I know Governor Abercrombie tried to do this, Governor Lingo's tried to do this, and anyway, back to Governor Burns. They've all had great ideas on how to diversify the economy away from tourism. But for one reason or another, it always comes back to tourism because, you know, we just haven't been able uh, either uh, to pull uh, all the capital we, we would need to to truly diversify or a talented pool of people specific to that industry that could help us. Or um, Hawaii is just not seen as a place that could uh, offer things that other places in the world 
that have been able to diversify, find diversified industries around tourism. That doesn't mean that we don't stop trying. I think we should. Uh, we should continue to try. But in the meantime, uh, we're not going to find another industry overnight uh, that will employ over 200,000 people uh, or bring in $2 billion in tax revenues or bring in $17 billion in, in revenues uh, that the tourism industry does. So let's make it more responsible. Let's make it more sustainable. Let's make it more resilient. Uh, and let's do it in such a way that the local people don't feel uh, that they're being shortchanged, that they're being left out, or that everything that is being done at the, uh, for the tourists and at their expense. When I was on the city council, uh, I championed legislation there to create a Hanama Bay uh, Special Reserve Fund. Let me go into it, just take a, a minute or so to do that. And that is the Harris administration at the time, Mayor Harris, it proposed you know, a fee to charge people to go to the Bay. Never before had that been uh, offered, uh, or I should say introduced. The problem I had with that, it was, it was the monies collected at Hanama Bay to perhaps limit the number of people that would go down there, because you're gonna charge a fee now, it's no longer free, would go into the general fund. And the problem I had with that is that, well, if it goes into the general fund, how do we know, or how does that person who's assessed a fee know that in the future, uh, whatever it needs to be done at Hanama Bay, the improvements that need to be done, um, you know, could be bathrooms, uh, could be the road, the, the parking area and so forth, uh, or things along the, the beach area uh, are gonna be done. Uh, because once it finds its way in the general fund, it could go to other areas. So I propose that those monies go into a special fund for the preservation, maintenance, and education uh, of those who come into Hanama Bay. And let's recall, re let's rename it the Hanama Nature Preserve. Uh, and let's make sure that as tourists are charged to use the beach, because you cannot charge local people to use the beach, that there's a parking fee that locals would pay and residents would pay if you're gonna park your car at Hanama Bay. And I'm very happy to see that this present city council uh, has basically kept it in place by even uh, charging a higher fee now uh, for people to go down to the Bay. I really believe when we talk about how do we make a, a, an industry that will be uh, much more receptive for people here, you know, because the complaint is that, you know, there's too many people using many of the popular attractions, trails, the valleys, what have you, uh, that the local people are used to. Well, let's institute a user fee so that it'll be maintained properly. And those who use it a lot will pay for it. And we're talking in this case, the tourists, as long as it goes back into a special fund. The other thing I think we should be doing uh, is finally uh, being able to root out illegal vacation rentals in the neighborhoods. I've always said I'm fine with vacation rentals existing in resort areas. That's where they should be and compete with resorts and hotels for that people that come here. But when you go in the neighborhoods, that's when you get into problems because of the fact absentee ownership, you drive up the cost of renting those spaces, local people can't afford it. Uh, so uh, I think there's gonna be an all out uh, effort by the county governments, fortunately, uh, and the industry and the state working together to see how we can do that and then set aside more opportunity for affordable housing. Yeah, thanks. Okay, we, we only got a short time left. You you wouldn't you didn't think you'd get away without talking about the rail. Where do we go from here? Well, I think right now we just got to make sure they clean up uh, the the house there. You know, they they thought that when they asked the last executive director uh, to basically step aside, uh, Andy Robbins, that they were now going to be able to uh, show uh, improvement, but that didn't happen. There was a bunch of backroom shenanigans, backdoor dealings that came to light thanks to Senator Favela and some media folks. So they got to clean up their house. And that led to the resignation of the chair of the hard board. So that's number one. Number two, I think they should make a commitment that they're going to start interim service and get it to Middle Street sooner rather than later. There's enough money there right now uh, without having to look for future funding to complete that and start interim service. Dennis, the sooner people ride, the better off we would be, even if it goes from a Waipaho to a law stadium, let people then get on the buses to express bus service to get them riding, to create some momentum. Because transit-oriented development will lead to more affordable housing. 
And that's what we want to see, the TOD benefit. I've always said, if you like rail, you're going to love transit-oriented development. Thanks. Believe it or not, uh, time is running out. Uh, yeah. Uh, you've been watching Politics in Hawaii with Dennis Isaki. Mahalo to Mufi Hanneman and to the viewers on Think Tech Hawaii. Please log on to thinktechhawaii.com and support our hardworking crew and volunteer staff. See you again in two weeks. Aloha. Ahuiho malamapono. Thank you, Mufi. Aloha.